Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here at The Strand. We are so happy to have everyone here. Uh, before we launch into a discussion of Mega's debut novel, Burning, I'd like to share a little bit of history about The Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 93 years, The Strand is a sole survivor, still run by third generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. Without our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we are so excited to have with us Mega Majumdar, who is celebrating the release of her new novel, A Burning. Mega was born and raised in Calcutta, India. She moved to the United States to attend college at Harvard University, followed by graduate school in social anthropology at John Hopkins University. She works as an editor at Catapult and lives in New York City. A Burning is her first book. And on a personal note, I have to say she's one of the nicest people I've ever worked with in publishing. Next, joining her is Maris Kreisman. Maris is the host of the Lit Hub podcast, The Maris Review, the creator of Slaughterhouse 90210, a blog and book from Flatiron Books in 2015 that celebrates the intersection of literature and pop culture. She's a writer and a critic, as well as a former book editor. And most recently, she was the editorial director of Book of the Month. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mega and Maris. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sabir. Thank you, Sabir. Mega, congratulations, <laughs> first of all. Thank you so much, Maris. As I was saying before um, we invited everyone into the room, it's such a dream and it's so surreal for me to be chatting with you. I've loved your profiles. I've loved your writing. Um, and you've been such a champion of this book already. Um, and in as I told to... you, you make <laughs> you look so good for championing this book, which is so freaking good. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I, before we really get into things, Mega, I was wondering if you could just tell us how you're doing, how it is to be publishing a book at this time, what's going on in your head, that kind of thing. Yeah, um, it's such a strange time to be publishing a book. Um, I think, you know, I have been trying to, to hold two things in my mind. And one is that I am so proud of this book. I worked so hard on it and I hope it has a life and it finds its readers. Um, and at the same time, I recognize that, you know, this is a moment that is just so much bigger than anything to do with my book, you know? Um, in the middle of an uprising here where people's lives are at stake and huge questions about the future of the country are at stake. Um, and so I'm just trying to hold both of those truths um, in mind. That, that's a good answer. That, and, and I don't know, I, I found that as an American, I read your book before the pandemic started, I think. And um, now we're at this unprecedented new stage in history where events in America are eerily like the events that happen in your book in India. Yeah. Um, it's been so strange to see that because I, sorry if I cut you off. I feel like I started speaking before. <laughs> You asked your question, but I was like, yes, that is so true. Um, <laughs> I, I started writing the book in such a similar mood, you know, several years ago, but paying attention to the same things, you know, how we live under these systems that are oppressive and discriminatory and profoundly unjust. Um, and it's so strange that the book is landing in this moment when those questions are at the front of mind for so many of us. Um, and I think it has been particularly strange because some stuff like 
pages of the book, there's a curfew. Um, and later in the book, there's um, an incidence of police brutality. And I never thought that those particular things would have such specific resonance right now. I mean, we had a curfew in New York until a few days ago. Yes. And, and I, I think about the chapter about the police officer who was accused of excessive violence in, in what you call it, slum demolition. A lot. I think about that a lot because you have this very short chapter about what happens to him afterwards. And I feel like a lot of us are trying to figure out what happens to police after they are violent. <laughs> Yeah. Um, tell me, I, I think the main thing that I first noticed about the book is that the pacing is extraordinary. Um, I just wanted to inhale it. How do you write a book that feels so profound but moves so quickly? Um, I'm so glad you felt that way, Maris, because that was something that I worked really hard on. Um, it was very important to me to write a book that would say something intellectually serious, but also be entertaining. And I think I found a lot of energy and food for thought in TV shows. And, you know, this idea of um, binge watching a TV show um, I think there is such incredible craft in that, you know? Um, how do you make a person so invested in your characters that they have to know what happens to this character? You know, how do you open and close your episodes or chapters? Um, what do you do with each sentence so that it helps the reader build a world around what you're talking about mm -hmm. without bogging them down in detail? And that is, of course, very different in books than it is in, in TV. Um, Give me but, an example of, of a couple of shows that were particularly inspiring. Oh, my God. I'm trying to think. I think at the time I was probably watching... Um, you know, shows like Mad Men, and there was actually, I don't know if um, anybody watching this will remember, but at the Museum of the Moving Image, there was a Mad Men exhibit a while ago where they played, um, did you go to that? I saw pictures only. <laughs> <laughs> they no. played um, scenes from the show. See very clearly what was written and then what it became. And I found that so interesting. Um, so I guess stuff like that felt really um, like energizing to me. Um, yeah, and then lately, what have I been watching? Probably just stuff like Succession and Broad Church and stuff like that. <laughs> what a good time to watch all of that stuff. <laughs> um, but it takes only a couple of hours to read your book and it takes a while to watch. This is one of the only examples I have of a, a, a book being more quickly absorbed than, <laughs> than your favorite TV show. Tell me about what you learned about what details are necessary to, to, to get the reader to be able to imagine a bigger, broader world just from those. Are you still? I think we've got a little bit of a drag. Oh, am I back? back? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I think I froze for a second. Um, yeah. Details. Um, you know, it was such a balancing act for me because I knew that, especially in the opening pages of the book, what I needed to be clear about were the stakes, because otherwise I would have opening pages and um, when you have that kind of flood of detail of you know place and characters and you as the reader don't quite know why you're being told all of this mm -hmm. that leads to either confusion or boredom and i think confusion and boredom um 
were the enemy of what I was trying to do. Um, so the details that I chose were things like somebody being able to buy a phone only on an installment plan which, you know, you pay it piece by piece because you can't afford it all at once. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, a, a guava seller who sits on the street corner that you have this kind of joking, teasing relationship with. So I wanted these details that were very small, but that I hoped were what kind of world exists such that this detail can be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you for the most part, tell this story from three unique perspectives. How, tell me about getting inside the voices of three very different characters. About these three characters, um, one is this young woman who all she wants is to rise to the middle class and keep her job at the mall. Um, but she makes this politically risky comment on Facebook um, and gets into big trouble for it. And then the second character is um, a school teacher who feels that he's not really having the kind of vigorous impact on the nation that he would have hoped. Um, and he becomes drawn um, to this right wing political party. And the third character is um, a person who lives on the very margins of society and chases this wild dream of becoming a movie star and goes to these week weekly amateur acting classes. Um, and I think I, I found their voices by, um, I think it definitely helped that I was able to write two of them in the first person and stay very close to them in that way, mm -hmm. stay very close to their, to their bodies and their experiences of suffering and shame. Um, and with the school teacher who, you know, makes moral choices that are questionable, I chose to be in the third person where I still didn't want to write a flat villain. I really wanted right. a reader to empathize with him and understand why he was making these choices, but also to have a little bit of skeptical distance where you can look mm -hmm. at this person and say, wait, why is he doing that? And what would I do in that situation? Yeah, and it, you, the two characters who you choose to write in the first person are so intimate that, yeah, I. He was not someone that I would have cared to get to know any better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Um, tell me a little more about the character of Lovely, um, because she is, I, if I'm pr pronouncing this correctly, a hijra? Yes, she's a hijra. Hijra. Um, and to me, that position in society is so interesting because she is someone who is reviled, but who is also believed to have a, you write, a special telephone line to God. And so she gives blessings at weddings and, and baby showers. And how, how, does, how do these two very different views coexist? Um. So Lovely is part of this very specific Indian social category of a hijra where um, it's really a category at the intersection of gender and religion and very importantly class. Um, and, you know, there are anthropologists who have done rich, detailed work on hijra communities um, like Beb of Saria and Gayatri Reddy, for example, if anybody watching is, is interested in reading more. Um, but I felt that for this character, I wanted to write somebody who is burdened with so much shame. She's constantly told by society that this is her place in life and um, she doesn't deserve any better. And she just refuses it, you know. She does and she puts this shame back on other people. So I wanted to write this kind of joyous and bold and defiant arc for this character who, you know, 
just refuses to accept that this is all that she can have. And she chases the boldest dream in the book. Yeah. And, and then there's Shivan who, who just wants to not be in the slums. Just the, her great big burning ambition is to, to be a member of the middle class. Um, tell me, tell me more about that and, and how you pr portrayed, um, the character of Shivan. Um, you know, I, I was interested in writing somebody who she cares about keeping her job at this clothing store at a mall. She cares about having a reliable water supply to her residents. Um, she cares about helping out her mother so that they can make a living. Um, but because of who she is and because of aspects of her identity, it is very easy for, for such an extremist state to impose a narrative on her that she has never sought out and she has never accepted, you know? So it's very easy for such a state to say, oh, look at this person who has these incidents in her background and who has these elements of her identity. And it's very easy for such a state to scapegoat her. So I guess I was interested in thinking about, you know, who gets to tell their own story and who has a story um, that yeah i and so much of the the character of jivan s seems even to be about who has the privilege of being able to trust other people or yeah. to trust other, or to trust an institution certainly yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. You know, I was interested in how we move forward when we live within these institutions that don't serve us, you know, whether that's the education system and your school, whether that's, you know, trying to get better housing, um, whether that's trying to make sure that you have secure employment. There are all of these systems which don't serve you. And yet people move forward with such intelligence and such humor and such determination. And so who gets to do that? And also, you know, even the kind of freedom that you can exercise in such a situation, you are so constrained, you know, you, you have agency and you have willpower, but there are only so many things that you can do. You have some agency. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yes, I, even even what you get to dream um, is is imposed by by the constraints of society, and yeah. I guess that's why Lovely feels like such a kind of an escapist character within this <laughs> other in this world. Yeah, probably that's that's very interesting. I hadn't thought of her as escapist, but I definitely see that you know this um this arc that i chose to write for her definitely feels like it's more buoyant and it's able to have more uplift than maybe some of the others <laughs> um tell me a little bit more about the writing of the book how long did it take you where were you writing? What conditions did you work under? Uh, did you have a full-time job this whole time? Oh, I no. did, yeah. So I wrote the book over about four years and um, I was working the whole time. Um, I work as an editor at Catapult um, and I was probably an assistant when I, when I started on this. Um, and my process was, you know, just finding a few minutes in the morning before work, um, mm -hmm. before I looked at my work email and became, you know, just too occupied with what I had to do that day. Um, so it was very slow, but I think something that I found very freeing was. I hope I'm losing you. Oh, did I freeze again? You froze a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, I was just saying that something that I found very freeing 
was this knowledge that nobody was waiting for my book. You know, it didn't matter if I wrote <laughs> my book or not. And it was up to me to draw on these reserves of inner discipline and just sit down every day and make some progress. And I think writing the book taught me to write and taught me to have that discipline in a way. So yeah, it's been such an interesting process. Yeah. And, and when did you, when, at what point in, in writing the book or did you finish when, did you feel like, oh, I should get an agent now and uh, sell <laughs> this thing? Um, I waited to do that stuff until I was done, I think. Um, or I felt like I was done. Um, I waited until a point where I didn't really know what else I could do to make it better. Um, I put it away for, I think, a couple times. I put it away for a few weeks once and then a few weeks once again, um, just so I could come back to it and read it with the, you know, cold and distracted <laughs> eyes of a reader, you know, and yeah. see where I wanted to put it down and pick up my phone because that's devastating. You don't want that to happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> so in a moment, in any moment in my book where I felt like that was happening, I knew that that moment needed more work. Um, but I knew also that, you know, I had, I had one shot at this. Um, so I wanted to make the best thing that I could make at that time before um, looking for an agent or anything like that. Absolutely. Um, did the work you were doing at the time, because you were, because this is, you know, you read and edit, did the work you were doing inform your novel or how you treated the act of writing? Yeah. Tell me about that. yeah, that's such a cool question. Um, I think it definitely did. I think as an editor, you read um, so many manuscripts, you get a sense for what kind of complexity and movement and sentence level surprise feels extraordinary to you and moves mm -hmm. you. And then you have something really concrete to aim for in your own work. So I found it really nourishing to read very widely and see what other people were working on. Um, and I think I came away also with a very clear sense of the things that were important to me for this book. Like I knew that I wanted to write a book that moved and had velocity. Um, sure that each paragraph was you know either like moving a book forward in in its story or moving it so that you would have you know deeper movement into the character so like some mm -hmm. kind of movement in every paragraph and every page um and i was relentless in asking my manuscript you know why should anyone care why should anyone read you you know and i think um I think that is such a you know, cold and terrible, but also yeah. I found very important question. There, is, there are so many stories. There are so many options for what somebody can do with their very scarce leisure time. Why should they pick up my book? I felt like I needed to answer. It seems like perhaps you are your harshest editor, but it worked <laughs> out. Like, I feel like there are so many writers who are like, I am my harshest editor and it's such a <laughs> burden for me. But like, you can look at your work with such a discerning eye. Well, I tried. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> maybe there will be a reader who picks it. As, I don't know what she was talking about. This is terrible, but um, I tried. <laughs> I mean, you don't look at Goodreads, do you? <laughs> you know, I looked at Goodreads months ago before um, the book came out when I was anxious and I was like, oh, is anybody aware of my book? Um, so I looked at it then and I remember some very generous comments from back then, but I haven't looked since. And I think, Good job. 
that's keeping me sane. <laughs> that I, that's my my number one advice for any editor, <laughs> any editor, and well, yes, and any author with a book out. Um, yeah, and and if you've got James Wood writing a um, beautiful, beautiful rave. It's okay if there's some <laughs> random on Goodreads who doesn't have an avatar. <laughs> Everyone likes different things, right? Um, what have you been reading lately? Um, I have been reading, so I, I brought this book over from my bedside where it has been living. Um, I've been reading this book, We Cast a Shadow wow. by Morris Carlos Ruffin. Um, it is so sharp, often very funny, um, but just this incredibly astute, sharp book. I'm really into it, um, just about 100 pages into it. And then um, I would love to shout out a couple of my June pub month buddies. Um, <laughs> I just got their books yesterday, so I'm very excited to read them. One is The Margot Affair by Sanai Lemoine. Um, and I think this is a novel about an affair and it's set in Paris. And Victor Laval says it's a page turner. So well, and, you are great at selling too. <laughs> <laughs> and the other book that I got yesterday, which also came out this month, is Pizza Girl by Jean Kyung Fraser. And um, this one, I have, I have read interviews with her where it's talked about as a slacker comedy. Um, it sounds hilarious. The cover blurb says, it's a sublime ode to obsessive outcasts and lovable screw-ups. So it sounds really fun. Um, I'm very excited to read these. And, and are you reading for pleasure these days? Like, what, what is your world like now? <laughs> Um, it has been very busy and a little bit frenzied, um, you know, um, I'm working full time. Um, I usually have a couple interviews or things every day, um, an event like this in the evening, which um, I've been so grateful for, frankly. I didn't think that there would be any interest in the book. Um, definitely not at this level. So I've been very, very grateful that people are willing to pick up the book and often engage with it so deeply and thoughtfully um, as you have done, Maris. Um, and so I'm very excited for when things get really calm again and I can read a ton. Um, mm -hmm. But so in addition to We Cast a Shadow, which I just showed people another book, which I have really been thinking about a lot, which I'll just shout out here is um, The Atlas of Reds and Blues by Devi Laskar. It's about an Indian American woman who is shot by a police officer. And as she is wounded, she reflects on her whole life. And a very surprising thing in this book is that it somehow, while doing that, also encompasses this really intriguing history of the Barbie doll, which I did not expect, but it's, um, it's doing a lot and it's, it's a really beautiful book. So I recommend it for anybody who hasn't read it yet. That's so good. Tell me a little bit about being an editor at Catapult, which is this very cool indie press, and then being an author published by Knopf, which is one of the, premier imprints of, of the biggest book publisher. Have, have, they, have you taken, you have to rave about both of them, obviously, but <laughs> have you learned things from both places that you would want to integrate? I think the beautiful thing is that I can truthfully rave about both of these places. Um, Catapult is such a special place. I mean, my colleagues are all, you know, writers and artists and poets. And it's a place where I think
Mega, I think I think you mm. cut out for a couple oh. seconds. Oh, <laughs> I was just raving about Catapult and <laughs> saying how everybody at Catapult or many of us have creative practices. You know, they're writers and poets and artists. And so there's this very intimate level of care that everybody brings to working with authors. And I think that's the same level of care that I felt at Knopf. Um, I know that it's, you know, part of a huge company, many times bigger than Catapult. But for me, it has actually felt really intimate. Like the people that I work with most closely, my editor, Jordan Pavlin, who is an icon and um, the person who has led publicity, Gabrielle Brooks, who legend, she has opened so many doors for this book. So I just feel that same level of care for them. And I think that's what every writer dreams of is, you know, having people work on your book who, who really care about the book. And, and tell me where your literary agent fits in here too. My agent, Eric Simonoff, um, he is incredible. Uh, I mean, I think some of his other writers are like Jhumpa Lahiri. So <laughs> um, he has been, he actually helped me do really sharp edits on the book. Um, we did a round of structural edits and input was completely invaluable, especially in shaping the ending, which has been, you know, which I've been so grateful for because now I get a lot of people telling me that, you know, they loved the ending and they felt that it was inevitable. And um, a lot of work went into that. And Making so much of that work it. was Eric's, yeah. Um, he has been such an advocate for this book. It's been really great. And tell me a little bit more about readability. Because I, I feel like that is something that genre writers constantly are told to think about. And then you get into the world of literary fiction and sometimes it's just like, just dignify us with your beautiful thoughts. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think readability was so important to me um, for this book because the, I wanted this book to have a certain force. I wanted this book to forcefully ask questions about the rise of the right wing and about how people live with, you know, love and humor and jokes through that. So I knew that for this question, to have power, the book would need to draw someone in. It would really need to invite someone in. I didn't want to write, you know, a polemic. I didn't want to write some kind of dry argument. I wanted to write a really entertaining book that could also do the serious task that I wanted it to do. So I think that is, I mean, I think that is so important. And the other part of it is, you know, I am very conscious of the Time. And I saw my book ultimately as, you know, if, if it ever got published, I saw it as making that kind of claim on someone's time. So I wanted to be very aware of that claim and very respectful of a reader's time. So, you know, it doesn't always mean that a book has to like speed through and be pacey. There are beautiful books that linger um, and, you know, their ambitions are different. But for this book, that was its particular ambition. Mega, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question, but I want to warn the, the audience that we're going to start taking questions from Facebook and from Zoom. So now's your chance. <laughs> Get to ask Mega something about her brilliance. Um, Tell me more about, <laughs> your book takes place in a prison uh, for, for a lot of it. And I think that we in America are, are only just getting used to the idea that perhaps 
the incarceration system is is entirely wrong and bad how did you had you have you visited a prison in india D do you know what conditions are like did you research um how did you bring that world so vividly to life um that was I watched a lot of, so there are all of these local news channels which have documentary videos of, you know, visiting women's prisons. And that's where I found a lot of the texture um, and, you know, reality of what a day in such a place might look like. Um, the idea that, you know, you have this you have a small what's called a cottage industry where you perhaps make pickles or jams and things like that um, so I watched those very rough um, videos for a sense of the texture I, I often find that watching a visual is so helpful for me as a writer to really get a sense for what I might be trying to portray and to you know help spark that imagination for me, um, yeah. That's great. Hey, thank you so much. Um, we are now going to take some questions from you. So the first one from Anissa A is, what books did you read as a child in India? And did those books have any influence on your own writing? Oh, that's such a fun question. Thank you, Anissa. I think I know who this is. So thank you, Anissa, for your support of the book. Um, I read so widely as a kid, you know, um, my parents would take me to these used bookstores. And I would just they were just little stacks of books on the sidewalk, nothing more than that. And I would just like scan all the spines and pick out Nancy Drew. And sometimes if they didn't have Nancy Drew, I would pick out the Hardy Boys. And <laughs> I would pick out um, travel writing. I read so much travel writing. I read, you know, whatever I find, Paul Thoreau. I read Peter Matheson. Um, I read mysteries. I loved, you know, Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie. And I think I learned something about velocity and suspense from those books. Um, and I think I also grew to revere this idea that, um, you know, a book can be fun and, and that's not a shallow thing. You know, a book can be fun and still be really transformative for you in a very profound way. I love that. Um, our next question is from Amrit Paul Kerr and she asks, please share tips for upcoming writers, specifically women of Indian origin. Um, there are so many levels on which one might answer such a question. Um, if you're looking for, you know, how to get started writing something, I would say think about what you see around you. Think about what makes you angry. Think about what you always want to talk about with your friends and write, if you can, from somewhere very close to that place. Um, I think that place holds such incredible energy. Um, and then, you know, in terms of practical tips, I would suggest reading very widely. There are so many literary magazines which publish beautiful, thoughtful work and getting a sense for what your peers are writing about, what they are responding to um, is so helpful. That's great. Um, the next one is from Shea Paolo. We see the rise of the far right in a burning, and currently in India, the US, Brazil, and across the world. Did it feel heavy to tackle this as a writer? Um, yes, for sure. Um, you know, the book, I hope, holds plenty of laughter and humor and lightness, but it also does go to a few pretty dark places. Um, and 
writing about that in the terrain of fiction, I knew that I, I did want to write about it. I mean, that is the place of alarm and fear that I was coming from, is this rise of extremism. Um, so I had to face it in the book. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that when the book does go to such a dark place, it feels necessary and it feels that the book has you know, spoken what it wants to speak in various other ways before coming to this form of expression. I, I saw that I missed one, Mega, so I'm going back to okay. Phil L. in Australia who says, I'm interested to know who your writing influences might be and any favorite authors. And then she says, I'm looking forward to reading A Burning. Which oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so many influences. Um, and I actually, I want who your favorites are, Maris, or one or two. So I'll, I'll pass this on to you in a second. But, um, you know, I, I love Jhumpa Lahiri, Arundhati Roy. Um, I really love the work of um, Daniel Muinuddin, who is this Pakistani writer who wrote a story collection called In Other Rooms, Other Wonders, which beautiful title and beautiful book. Um, and then I've loved, um, I have this book right here actually, which I <laughs> love. It's called We Need New Names. It's by No Violet Bulawayo. It's about these kids in Zimbabwe who hold big dreams. And um, I really love the children in this book. It's so hard to write complex kids mm -hmm. characters and this book does it so well um i think that i absorb quite a bit from every book that i read so i try to read quite widely um what about you maris i i mean okay so i'm kind of all over the place and i and my job right now is to read just everything I can that's new. And, and I feel a specific pleasure time. and burden to make sure that this <laughs> pandemic does not leave anyone uh, sitting out. But um, I love Miriam Taves. She's a Canadian author. Um, All My Puny Sorrows is, is one of her big ones. Helen Oyayemi. Um, I love everything she's ever done, but Boy Snowbird. Um, holds a special place in my heart. Um, and and she, she is also excellent at writing about super fun things until you pull back and realize how deep and heavy they are. Um, and Elizabeth McCracken, we were talking about her earlier. Um, <laughs> the Giant's House is the best kind of literary fairy tale. I'm so excited um, to read it. Must, we, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> um, all right, here's one from Bandana T. Can you talk a little bit about how your formal education prepared you to write this book, your degree in anthropology, as well as the MFA? Um, so I was in an MFA for a, for a year. It was a two year program and I couldn't complete it. So I actually do not have an MFA. Um, but I did go to grad school for anthropology. Um, and I think, you know, anthropology is all about going out into the world and listening to other people's narratives and trying to understand them with complexity. So I think anthropology has helped me be attentive to complexity and nuance in narrative, to be attentive to what is surprising and unexpected and what you don't expect people to say or feel or you know behave um so reading ethnographies um reading anthropology has definitely given me a lot to you know bring over into my toolkit as a as a novelist excellent from calvin have you started a new project? And if so, how does it feel to write knowing that you have a following this time? <laughs> um, I, I am working very slowly on a second novel, um, which is very, very different. I don't, 
you know, I am, I am so grateful for the attention and you are very kind to say that I have a following, but you know, you do, I think, <laughs> I think every book has to prove itself. And I think the writing of a book takes place in such a place of solitude where it's just you having a conversation with the things that are interesting to you. So the opening up of that document um, is always such a future event whenever you're working on a book. Um, yeah, but thank you for asking and thank you for expressing interest. It's such a, it's such a boost. Marlene S. asks, are any of your characters based on actual people you know? <laughs> no, they're not based on actual people. I made them up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm double checking. I think that we have gotten to everyone. You have like one more second to type your question <laughs> in furiously. <laughs> Megan, thank you. This has been so much fun. Oh, here, here's one from Paulette. Okay. What's your favorite book you've edited? Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's like all of her children. Yes. Just maybe talk about one. I can tell you about um, one that just came out as, um, I can tell you about two maybe that came out earlier this year. Uh, one is called Night Theater. It's by a writer called Vikram Paralkar. And this novel, also set in India, um, also social criticism, but it's this spooky tale of a doctor in this village who one night has to bring a dead family back to life. And through this ghostly story, it's such a sharp criticism of bureaucracy and corruption and the things that we expect of doctors. Um, so that's Night Theater, it's a brilliant novel. And the other book that I'll talk about came out um, in March, just as everything was closing due to the pandemic. And that's Spirit Run by Noe Alvarez. It's a book of nonfiction memoir. And um, Noe is the son of Mexican immigrants. He grew up in the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, he worked summers at this apple packing plant with his parents um, and his parents told him to to get out you know to make a better life for himself and so he left and went on this incredibly long run with a group of Native American people from Alaska to Guatemala they ran the whole way and um, it's just this incredible story which you know if you enjoy a book about running an adventure, it's for you. If you want to read about immigration, it's for you. If you want to read about labor, it's for you. It takes on so much and it's called Spirit Run. Well, I'm adding that to my list right now. <laughs> Did I pitch it successfully to you, Maris? Oh my gosh. <laughs> From Alaska to Guatemala. <laughs> Canada seems like it must be so long. <laughs> <laughs> um, a final question. From Amy Brennan, and this is this is great. Um, I am curious how the book has been received in India, and if it differs from how it has been received in the U.S. Um, it has received a lot of positive attention. It always makes me feel obnoxious to say things like that, but it has That's been true. <laughs> <laughs> it has been you know, received well, and I'm very grateful for it. I think one of my aims with the book was to write something that would ring true for somebody who lives in the US and has never been to India, doesn't follow Indian politics, um, as well as a book that would hold truth for somebody who lives in India and has lived in India their whole life. And I've been very grateful to see the book resonating with Um, I, I think, I think we are about done, but let's, Mega, if I were in a room with you, I'd be applauding. <laughs> I'd be my neighbors if I was doing that. 
but please remember to to buy a burning and uh, any of the other wonderful books that Mega has mentioned. Thank you so much, Maris. This was such a pleasure, and um, I hope I get to see you in person someday and give you a big thank you hug. Um, yeah. Like I said, you've boosted the book in such meaningful ways, and you it's not, ju not just my book. You've boosted so many people's books over the years that readers are able to find them, and it is incredibly valuable work that we are so grateful to you for. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both so much for a wonderful discussion. Uh, there were so many excellent books listed. I'm going to try and compile a list <laughs> of them when we're editing the video and I'll figure out something to do with it. But thank you all very much. I dropped the order link for a burning if you don't already have it in the chat. And thanks. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Sabir. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Thank you.